Yes, good morning. Uh, welcome to this sort of round table. Uh, as already did said, uh, well, I'm a volunteer member of the round table and I'll be moderating this, this particular panel. Uh, my career was nearly four decades with NOAA uh, working on R2O problems, the challenges of benefiting operations, production and national weather service by the, the NOAA research laboratories and the work being done in a broad enterprise. So I know the challenges of, of transferring knowledge and information and requirements across these boundaries. So it's exciting for me to be here this morning working on this and on the panel as a volunteer member. Uh, after NOAA, I worked briefly at Microsoft. I went into private industry, Microsoft. And then my last seven or eight years were working with the Climate Corporation, uh, recently with Bear Crop Sciences, working on global agriculture. Uh, put in one final shameless plug. As president of the AMS, I get to plan a meeting. And my next, the next meeting will be, the annual meeting will be in January uh, 27th, 2024 in Baltimore. And the theme of that will be living in a changing environment. And, and I'm bringing this to the forefront of the AMS as I recognize this is really an all hands on deck challenge that we need to face and we need to be there. So without further ado on that, uh, the morning panel is going to be on user capabilities and needs. In this panel discussion, we'll hear from representatives of a few key federal agencies who have been asked to provide a brief overview of their relevant work and challenges in the climate macroeconomics space. Our goal of this panel is to focus the roundtable's own sense of the work, which is critical as we move forward with this charge. This material and discussion from today will inform our efforts, the roundtable effort, tomorrow to develop our work. The logistics of the panel are simple. Each speaker, of five, each five, five speakers, will have 10 minutes to provide their remarks. I'll each introduce each panelist at the time they speak. I, at the nine minute mark, I'll give them one minute uh, heads up, and then everyone will be finishing in 10 minutes. After those 15 minutes, we'll move on to a general QA for the group. So, unless there are any questions, let's move on to our, our panel presentations. And the first presenter will be Heather Boucher. She is a member of the president of President Biden's Council of Economic Advice. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and I wanted to give a shout out to thank Wendy and Bob and Bridget and the whole team at the National Academies for all you've done to put this workshop together. Um, we at the Council of Economic Advisors are very excited about today's conversation. Um, we're excited about it because this conversation is core to the president's economic plans. He often says that he wants to build an economy from the bottom up and middle out. And that means making sure that our economic policy prioritizes growing and supporting America's middle class. To do that, we need tools that allow us to understand what's happening in the economy in real time so that today's policymakers know where, when, and how to take action. Climate scientists have built up the evidence that climate change is real, and we can see the physical damage is rising. I'm sure Sarah will discuss NOAA's analysis showing that 2022 was the third costliest year on record with climate damages totaling $165 billion. And the reality of the economic challenges we will face as we rapidly transition to clean energy are becoming apparent. The problem we face is that our toolbox for assessing these risks and integrating them into our economic policymaking is limited, and what tools we have aren't purpose-built. Without the ability to assess the economic risks of the physical and transition risk of climate change, we may be blind as to how best to reach the president's goals of achieving net zero carbon by 2050 while growing and supporting America's middle class. How do we take action while also delivering stable macroeconomic conditions that support our goals of full employment and price stability? That's why we're here today. And why we are not the only ones having this conversation. A wide range of financial institutions, including the IMF, the World Bank, cent uh, Central Banks, Central Banks, <laughs> the Congressional Budget Office, and Moody's are working to integrate explicit consideration of climate change risks into macroeconomic projections. That's why it's so exciting to be here today with all of you to better understand how climate change and the policy responses to it 
will shape growth pathways over near, medium, and long term. Let me walk you through the president's goals for this work, why we believe this work is important, and what we see as the analytic challenges. In May of 2021, the president signed an executive order on climate-related financial risk, climate change, and the massive energy system transition it requires present a range of economic, financial, fiscal, and macroeconomic risks to the United States. The executive order directs action across a number of executive office components and agencies to quantify, assess, and address climate change-related financial risks. It pushes the U.S. government to develop new tools or modify ones we already have to meet the analytic challenge of the economic risks we now face. This includes the financial system, life savings and pensions, federal, federal lending, procurement, as well as the federal budget. Specifically, Section 6A directs OMB and CA to develop methodologies to quantify climate risk within the economic assumptions and long-term projections of the president's budget. CA, OMB, and Treasury, the so-called Troika, jointly forecast GDP growth over the 10-year budget window, and OMB extends that out 25 years as part of the president's the presidential budgeting process. Now, Zach and I are here today representing two-thirds of that Troika to learn from all of you about how we can best incorporate the physical and transition risk of climate change into the U.S. government's processes. Last year, we released a white paper jointly authored by CA and OMB based on the work of an interagency technical working group we stood up to do this work across government. And here, I'd like to give a big shout out to all of the folks across government who worked on that report and who spent so many hours working across agencies and the executive office of the president towards rethinking our economic assumptions. We, through this work, we have identified a number of macroeconomic risks from the physical damage that climate change is inducing. These include increased intensity and frequency of weather extremes that destroy capital stocks and disrupt economic production. Extreme weather conditions that lower the productivity of labor and weather exposed capital stocks. Greater uncertainty as climate change increases financing costs for certain investment and affects the availability of insurance. The diversion of resources towards disaster response and recovery away from other productive investments, including investments to mitigate future climate risk. And the increasing risk of multiple simultaneously, simultaneous extreme extremes, raising the probability of systemic failures. We see that the macroeconomic risks of the transition are just as important. Energy is a primary input supporting production across the economy. As such, energy prices and volatility are important for macroeconomic outcomes. Indeed, we've seen over these past couple of years how energy and supply chain shocks can drive up economy-wide inflation. Our energy system depends on complex, interacting systems of long-lived infrastructure, which we must now completely transform on an extremely short time frame. This is both costly and introduces substantial uncertainty into energy markets and diverts resources towards this transition away from other purposes. While economies are always experiencing technological shocks, at no point in modern history have economies had to transform a key input over such a short time frame. The global energy transition will have significant implications for energy prices and volatility, which will affect global trade patterns, and by extension, affect the macro economy. It will affect the kinds of jobs and where those are located across the United States and across the world. It will have not only economic implications, but political economy implications as well. The scale and speed of the clean energy transition necessitates that policymakers have a firm grasp of the interim economic challenges. And then there's the effects of the interaction between these two sets of risks. High ambition climate policies lower physical risks, but at the same time, they may raise the transition risks. Because we've seen decades of delay in implementing climate policy, the rate of energy system transformation required to meet global temperature targets is very rapid. There are concerns that the transition may be chaotic. Transition can be lowered 
through credible long-term policies that set investor expectations for the long run and coordinate activity across countries and economic se sectors, what many call an orderly transition. At the same time, the adverse macroeconomic effects of climate change induced extremes and the need to respond to disasters could alter the ability or willingness of governments to provide global public goods through greenhouse gas mitigation. Thus, incorporating both physical and transition climate risk into government planning and forecasting is essential. And here is why is here is where we get to why we are so glad to have all of you, the participants um, of this workshop. In our work over this um, on these issues over the past two years, we've identified several analytic challenges. So let me go through those before I close. First, there is difficulty in representing the macroeconomic effects of the tech-driven subsidy-led climate policies of the administration. The idea behind the Inflation Reduction Act is that highly targeted subsidies and technologically specific policies accelerate technological development and, it, and uh, adoption, driving down energy costs to enable the energy transition. Representing these effects requires energy models with a rich array of policies, technological change, and deployment dynamics that are also coupled to the macro economy. We cannot simply plug a carbon tax into a model and assume an orderly transition. Yet this is common. This is a common assumption in much existing work in this space, um, but this has never been a realistic representation of how the energy minute. transition would occur on it. Um, Second, we see a limited quantification or understanding of the macroeconomic effects of physical climate change. And third, most existing modeling tools provide limited information uh, regarding the transition dy dynamics and uncertainty in the energy transition. Most macroeconomic models simulating climate policy are deterministic general equilibrium models. As such, these models do not capture the first order policy questions that revolving around uncertainty and transition dynamics. Which gets to the fourth issue. How do we think about a baseline within the context of climate aspirations that may not yet be law, but are our goals? The United States is committed to a 50 to 52 percent reduction in greenhouse gases, gas emissions by 2030 and to net zero by 2050. Yet the full set of policies the United States will implement to achieve these medium and long term goals are not yet clear. Whether additional policies to achieve U.S. emission targets continue this subsidy approach alone or pursue a combination of policies that also include carbon pricing and regulation will have implications for the total costs and macroeconomic effects of the energy transition. So let me end with a brief caveat that the goal of integrating climate risks into the macroeconomic projections underscores the limitations of how we tabulate GDP. By design, GDP excludes many of the serious damages of climate change that affect human welfare because they do they have neither large nor direct implications for economic output. And of course, at the same time, we know many of the actions that we will take to address the physical damages of climate change will also increase GDP. So given the rising importance of incorporating the negative externalities of climate change into our economic thinking, I'm especially excited to see the administration's focus on natural capital accounting announced last week. But there's certainly more to consider here as we try to integrate these negative externalities into our more traditional macroeconomic frameworks. In closing, I want to thank you all in advance for all of your help. Policymakers need new tools now. As we, are, as we are making policy decisions in real time, we cannot let analytic perfection be the enemy of the good. We need a theory of the case for how we're going to tackle these issues as quickly as possible, and we desperately need your help. I look forward to a rich discussion and learning from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Our next speaker on the panel will be Joe Kyle. He is the Director of Microeconomic Analysis at the Congressional Budget Office. Joe. Thanks, Brad. Um, oh, good, the slides are up. Um, so thank you, uh, Brad and Wendy and Bob and National Academies. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, climate change uh, um, 
poses a generational challenge for policymakers. Um, it is imposing and will impose increasing costs on the United States and on the rest of the world. And many of those costs will be borne by private entities um, or other governments. And some of those costs will be reflected in the federal budget. Um, likewise, uh, preventing a climate catastrophe would reduce those costs to the United States, the world um, broadly and um, reduce pressure on the federal budget. And our role at CBO is to provide Congress with information about the effects of climate change and the effects of climate change policy as they relate to the economy and the federal budget. Um, there's two important caveats I want to provide about CBO and the work we do, um, just for context. And one is that CBO is a nonpartisan agency. Um, we don't make recommendations uh, and don't have a, a preference over what choices policymakers make. Um, and related to that, we aim very much to be in the middle of distribution of, of possible outcomes when we do our work. Um, next slide, please. Or do I control that? Thanks. To, thanks to whomever. <laughs> um, so I want to share a brief schematic that we sometimes use just to um, provide a roadmap for how we think about how climate change and the federal budget interact. And it's a fairly straightforward schematic. Um, on the left-hand side of the chart, you'll basically see that uh, um, climate change occurs, uh, that affects output and it affects damage to the economy, um, big challenges in measuring how that is. But from a schematic perspective, um, three important elements are relevant to CBO's work. Um, and that is trying to understand how climate change affects revenue collected by the, by the government. Um, and that's usually tied to a GDP one way or another. Um, increases in mandatory for spending for programs like disaster release, relief and crop insurance, um, and also increases in discretionary spending um, through programs like uh, disaster relief after, after disasters occur. Um, it's important to note that the, ver the first two of those channels happen more or less automatically. That is, they don't require additional congressional action. Um, the third channel requires re requires choices by the Congress through uh, um, annual pro annual appropriations bills or appropriations after after disasters. Um, and the right hand side of the chart is simply reversing that um, that lawmakers can make choices about how to uh, spend money either through outlays or through the tax code, and that's going to affect both the federal budget and feedback to uh, to the climate. Um, just super quick on the next slide. Um, I want to talk about four different projects. Two of them relate to how uh, 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 climate how climate change affects the budget, and two of them are uh, about climate change policies. So ne next slide, please. Um, several years ago, and this actually goes back to 2016, which you know, and in, in maybe in climate science time is actually a very long time. But um, we did an analysis of the effects of hurricane damage on the economy. Um, and the federal budget and uh, how that is expected to grow between uh, the time of the work in 2075 or 20, the time of the work and 2075. Um, and one of the key takeaways or one of the key lessons of this is that I think um, it won't surprise people to understand that um, we expect climate damage to increase substantially over uh, the period. Uh, expected damage and expected effect on the federal budget are uh, to rise between a, a third and 40 percent. Um, and the, the, the slide on the right shows um, the same effects on uh, coastal populations where we expect the number of people at risk to, uh, to increase from uh, uh, about 1.2 million to about 10 million, so a, a factor of about eight. Um, a second slide that I didn't take from this report, but which is really interesting, is these are expected value results. And it's probably unsurprising that um, the estimate in 2025 was a fairly narrow band. The estimate over 2075 um, was much longer. There's a significant skew to the right on that. Um, a second takeaway from this slide, which you really can't see on the slide, is that we had an opportunity to redo the analysis, just the first piece of that analysis um, on projected damages in, 20, um, in 2025 three years after we did this analysis, and um, the level of costs had doubled by then. So I think it's an important lesson about the importance of sort of continually taking on board um, improvements in climate science and linking those to, to budgetary effects. Uh, next slide, please. A second project that we did, or a second example of projects that we did, is that in two years ago, in 2021, 
CBO began to explicitly include the effects of climate change in its estimate of GDP. And this was something that we hadn't, that implicitly might have been incorporated through uh, through variables that measure that become part of CBO's uh, forecast. But we wanted to explicitly take it on board. And we estimated, uh, I won't go into the details, but using top-down methods of changes in temperature and precipitation on output at the county level and aggregating that to the United States, um, we found that we, we estimated, we included in our estimate, um, a, re a reduction of GDP on, on the order of 1% after, after 30 years. Um, and I think it's there's two things to note about that. One is this is an effect on GDP. It's not an estimate of climate damage. Um, there's a lot of ways that climate can affect the climate damage would affect the economy that aren't necessarily recorded in GDP. Um, the second, and this goes to what I mentioned at the outset, that we try to aim to be in the middle of a distribution. So we um, averaged RCP 4.5 and 8.5 in, in this work. Um, I think this also highlights an area where additional work by um, this panel and in the research community more broadly about the ways that um, climate change is going to affect economic variables that are standard inputs to growth models are really important. So I'm thinking of things like productivity, labor supply, capital services, and so forth. Um, next slide, please. So let me turn to two projects briefly that we um, have done for the Congress, um, trying to understand the effects of policies that would address climate change. Um, so climate change policies can cover a broad range of potential outcomes. Um, they basically fall into three categories. And one is Pigouvian taxes, um, which are popular for economists to study, but rarely taken on board by, uh, by policymakers. Um, Subsidies for uh, alternatives or for green approaches, as was included in um, significant legislation in the last Congress, and um, various imposition of regulatory standards by, uh, um, by different regulatory agencies. So I, I want to just illustrate some of the work we've done for the Congress, um, focusing on two of those. Um, next slide, please. So every at the beginning of every Congress, um, and I apologize, this is a little little small to uh, to see. But CBO does a, a a document that we call budget options, and it's basically um, a long list of of policies that Congress could enact um, that would help address the the nation's fiscal situation. Um, one of those that we've included in the budget options volume for at least a decade would be to impose a, a tax on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we did several alternatives on that tax. Let me just focus on the top one, the top line. The I think the takeaways from this are that that a, a gas tax, even a, a modest one, would raise significant revenue. So um, in the first example, a $25 per ton tax that would increase at 5% real each year would raise about $900 billion or re reduce the deficit by about $900 billion over the 10-year budget window. And not shown on this, but discussed in the um, in the write up of this option is the effect on, on greenhouse gas emissions. We found that um, at the end of the ten year window, uh, this tax would in, would reduce emissions of greenhouse gases by about eleven percent. Um, next slide, please. The the second uh, example of recent work that we've done for the Congress focuses on um, one particular provision of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, the Reconciliation Act that was adopted at the end of the last Congress. Um, one minute. Thank you. Perfect. Um, in the in that there were um, there were subsidies for uh, for for clean electricity, for solar, for renewables. Um, for for nuclear and other forms of electricity that that don't um, estimate carbon or eliminate uh, I'm sorry emit carbon emit CO2, um, we we estimated at the end of the last Congress drawing on work from uh, um, rhodium and RFF as well as our own analysis using NREL's Reed's model that um, this would reduce emissions of uh, CO2 emissions from the electric power sector by about 62 percent. Um, over the course of the next decade. And that's the gray line in both figures. And I show those relative to, um, as, a, as a point of reference, I show them relative to EIAs and NREL's um, projections of emissions in that sector from uh, before the Reconciliation Act. And so you can see it's a pretty large reduction relative to, um, to those benchmarks. 
Um, I mentioned these all, both the, the first set of policies and uh, the first set of effects and these two policies because they typify the kinds of things that we get asked to do by the Congress. Um, it's, it's far from exhaustive, and I think it shows ways that uh, um, hopefully this community and the broader research community can uh, continue to draw on, uh, continue to produce research that, uh, that we can draw on. Um, I appreciate the time and uh, look forward to uh, the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Our next speaker will be Adele Morris. She is a senior advisor in the Division of Financial Stability at the Board of Governors of the U.S. Federal Reserve. Adele. Well, thank you. And I want to thank our co-chairs and the National Academies organizers of this, uh, this roundtable and this event. And thank you so much for including me. Um, what you're going to hear today is my personal opinions, like every Fed staffer ever, I have to say. You're getting my views and not to be confused with the official views of the Federal Reserve or our governors. Um, I want to talk about three of the mandates that um, financial regulators uh, um, need to fulfill and that can, you know, in which macroeconomic modeling and, and climate related factors can come into. And so there's at least three of these mandates that, that come up. One is supervision, another is financial stability, and the third is economic analysis, and in some cases, forecasting related to that. So these three mandates kind of involve different sorts of macroeconomic modeling and different implica Im implications for how climate-related factors might be embedded in there. So, so what are these things? Supervision refers to the safety and soundness of individual financial institutions. So different financial regulators have different uh, entities that they regulate and oversee and supervise. Um, and so the question is, if you're supervising an institution, are they resilient to various kinds of shocks and economic downturns, whether it's a, you know, a housing downturn or recession or what have you, are they in a position to remain solv solvent in, in a future that includes such a shock? That's supervision. Financial stability goes beyond the safety and soundness of individual financial institution, but looks at how can financial risks be transmitted or amplified across the financial sector and to the real economy. And this is certainly something that we've experienced in the United States when there, there's a downturn of, of a sort in the housing sector. And next thing you know, that has been transmitted and amplified in, um, damaging ways through the economy and the financial. So, so we've got a program at the Fed and other financial regulators as well, you know, monitoring, assessing, quantitatively surveilling various factors so that we can, you know, ensure that we, we, we have a, a look to the future. And so climate related factors can come into that. And so one of the things we're doing is trying to figure out, okay, what should we be monitoring and assessing from a financial stability perspective. The third mandate is economic analysis, and in some cases, forecasting, and that can be in service to a whole range of uh, objectives. It can be, we've heard policy analysis, you know, how should we design certain policies, uh, what might be fiscal implications going forward, et cetera. Um, for some of it, it's in support of monetary policy making. So each of these mandates um, may, argue for including climate related factors in your macroeconomic modeling, but how you do that and what simulations you do and what data characteristics you need for those projections could be quite different. So from a supervision and financial stability standpoint, you might want to focus on stressful scenarios. Maybe they're unlikely, but if they could happen and, and they could be a shock and it's something you want financial institutions to be resilient to, you want to understand, okay, what those projections look like, and then how do you do an analysis associated with those scenarios? For some applications, you might want to look for a more likely scenario where you know you're really trying to forecast what you think really is going to happen, or a range of things you th think are most plausible. In that case, you might want a simulation that's quite different than you might want 
for analysis of a stressful scenario. So in each of these mandates, in each of these contexts, there are a lot of technical questions about, well, what variables do you need? Which financial variables, which macroeconomic variables, and other things like what's the right time horizon? What's the right time step for a model? You know, that might be a, an influencing factor. You might not want five-year time steps if you're trying to really understand shorter run dynamics. You might need some sectoral and regional disaggregation. For example, you know, the folks who regulate Fannie and Freddie might be very interested in, in the housing sector outcomes and real estate outcomes. And so you're going to want a modeling platform and approach that incorporates some granularity that gets you into the sectors you're most interested in. So one example of the kind of scenario analysis that the Fed is doing, we just released the instructions for participants of a pilot climate scenario analysis exercise. And that came out last week. Now, this is to be distinct from a stress test because there there are not capital adequacy determinations being part of that. That means we're not gonna be passing judgment on in a supervisory kind of way on the analyses. It's an exploratory exercise, very different kind of uh, implications. So we're using our terms carefully there. Um, and we're um, asking firms to, to analyze, large firms to analyze their certain portfolios in light of scenarios of physical climatic damages and transition paths as well. Um, now, in terms of our capabilities, I would say we're still kind of in the R&D phase of thinking through what modeling tools do we need? You know, what, what data characteristics for projections do we need? What kinds of analyses are we going to do internally and per, perhaps externally with financial institutions involved? And I would say financial regulators in general are kind of assessing the tools they have available, trying to understand what capabilities they need. So this is a really timely conversation for us because we're, we're kind of all in the same situation of trying to understand how to, how to do this. And our, it, I think it's fair to say many of our standard macro models don't have necessarily all the right features in there to simulate you know, climate transition, greenhouse gas policies, or detailed energy technologies, that kind of thing. And, and then, of course, there's the whole issue how you model the macroeconomic implications of climatic disruption. Now, the good news is we have the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is the interagency uh, process and, and dialogue that's chaired by the Treasury Department. And in this group are the major US financial regulators, and they've created a climate committee. So it's the FSOC Climate Committee in which we can talk with each other. It's a forum for exchanging views and and technical approaches and uh, research, and, and that dialogue is ongoing. Um, I would say uh, this, again, is a very timely conversation for us, and so I just want to thank everybody in advance for what I know is going to be a rich discussion. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Adele. Okay, our next speaker will be Sarah Kapnick. She is Chief Scientist for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Advancing Policy and Program Direction for NOAA Science and Technology Priorities. Sarah. Thank you. Um, so something a little different now, we'll shift to the where we get our climate information. So NOAA is the agency that enriches our life through science. Our, re we, our science reaches from the surface of the sun all the way to the bottom of the seafloor to help citizens be informed of the changing environment around them. Our mission has three main components. Number one, science, to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, oceans, and coasts. Number two, service, to share that knowledge and information with others, engage with groups like this. And number three, stewardship, to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and resources. Next slide, please. So NOAA data and information products or services span hours and days all the way out 
to years to decades, even actually centuries. Um, and this work is at the very local scale where you live um, in your community, all the way to regional parts of the country, to the entire United States, but then also globally. So with us, we have physical, chemical, biological information. Our climate day and forecasts are all taken to inform all of these different pieces. NOAA has a wide range of capabilities and is an authoritative source of global environmental data that can inform and support risk management. On our observation side, we have environmental observations of the ocean, the atmosphere, biology, where the fish are located. We have forecasting and prediction products. These are go from weather to climate timescales. They also explain extreme events. With extreme events, we also provide pre-disaster support through early warning systems. Then when disasters are happening, we help guide and give information about what is unfolding. And then during disaster and post-disaster, we provide support through rapid responses, damage assessments, and restoration post-events. With all the data that we are collecting, we also produce data assimilation and management um, using our high-performance computing to be able to recombine the information to be able to gather more insights. We also produce products and services that we deliver. We provide your weather forecasts. Um, we also provide fishery forecasts, uh, reports, climate extreme analyses, and various tools of information that are useful. Um, and on this, there's all the examples from space weather out in space um, to information of drought and agriculture, um, as well as construction. And then at the um, longest time scale, as well as the global time scale, we in were involved in various reports, um, such as the IPCC and national climate assessments of the state of climate. Next slide, please. Um, as Heather mentioned, we recently just um, put out our billion dollar disaster report. Unfortunately, I had to turn my slides right uh, before it came out, but I can say that um, with the numbers, it was $165 billion in costs for $18 billion disasters last year. Um, it was the third largest year. These numbers have been growing. We've been tracking it and producing this information since 1980. Um, so we have the data back to 1980. Um, so we don't just produce the information on the weather and climate, but we're also starting to produce these derivative products that also are monitoring those disasters and their impacts. The bars here are the number of different events, and then the lines are those costs over time. Um, we're also recombining this information with other information with FEMA's National Risk Index, with census information to understand multi-hazard risk mapping vulnerabilities um, at the local scale. This provides us with additional information of socioeconomic vulnerability where communities may be most impacted by these types of events to be able to visualize it and understand it better. Next slide, please. Creating this data of climate information, the data, the forecast, the predictions, they aren't enough alone. We need to ensure that this data is used and that we are supporting its use and integration by decision makers. Um, with this, we have integrated into our team. We also have a chief economist um, who is my alternate um, joining this uh, roundtable. From this, we find that it's especially important to integrate social science and the hard sciences to get people out of harm's way in our experience. We have offices in every state and territory. Um, we do cost benefit analysis of our work. We understand how people are also under uptaking that information to be able to use it. Um, the chief economist team, Dr. Monica Grasso has a small team of economists and they provide all this decision support. They're also a leading partner on understanding how the science needs to be used and the quantification of its impacts. For example, we were a leading partner in this recent White House-led natural capital accounting initiative, looking to include natural resources and ecosystem services in national economic accounts. Um, going forward, we, will, we also support various agencies and program evaluations supporting, supporting um, how our information is used and how, um, how our restoration and conservation efforts are going through. With this, we're finding increasingly it's important to understand and quantify how adaptation can be measured. So all the different impacts that it has, not just on the ecosystems, but on all the other impacts to be able to understand the effectiveness of our work. Um, additionally, through our uh, National Weather Services Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences program, we've had extensive experience 
understanding how people are using the information to be able to reduce risk. Um, so for example, that group is currently developing an economic study using an agent-based modeling approach to understand how society responds to floods and other hydrologic phenomena. Um, we can't always think that we are perfectly rational in how we're going to use the information, uptake it, and then respond to it. And this analysis has been really critical for us to understand how we need to produce our information, but then also how we need to work with communities as they take it up. Next slide, please. In addition to providing all the data, we also transform environmental information into useful products and services to be able to make sure that people can use that. This is where the social science has taught us how we need to package that information and how people are now interacting with it. So on the bottom left is something called the sea level rise viewer. Potential erosion or loss of tax bases as property insurance stops becoming affordable, populations move elsewhere, um, has an impact on communities and coastal zones. We have clear cases of investing in um, sea level rise and trying to figure out how to handle it in cities um, looking for mitigation effects in Houston, Miami, New York City, Boston. There's new um, propos proposals in Charleston. The vast majority of mid to smaller coastal towns and communities remain extremely vulnerable to sea level rise coastal and coastal storms, but do not necessarily have the financial resources for implementation to deal with this. We're seeing this as a growing risk and we have, um, this is the viewer where anyone can go into it and start looking at what uh, sea level rise will um, affect over time in local communities. On the top left, I've also put a picture of heat.gov. After sea level rise, heat is a physical manifestation of climate change that is extremely damaging. It, can, it is damaging to agriculture. It is one of the largest killers in the United States when you have extreme heat. Um, it leads to losses of productivity of workers, loss of learning in schools. In urban areas, magnifying effects of concrete and lack of vegetation also amplify heat. Um, across the federal government, we are now compiling information on heat, how to deal with it, and also um, case studies of how local communities are trying to adapt to it, but also information of how it affects at local scales. Um, I welcome also viewing that to understand the different manifestations of these climate impacts, how it actually then deals with society and all those case studies to be able to understand and visualize and think through what does extreme heat mean and how does it affect people. Um, similarly, we have drought.gov that looks at drought and provides drought information from short term to long term. And then on the right hand side, I've put two pictures. One is the US Climate Resilience Toolkit, and the other one is the new Climate Mapping for Resilience and Adaptation. These are efforts that provide information across the entire federal government in one place of the future of climate. And information can be downloaded um, for projections of information of climate into the future, but also looking into the past. Um, and so these have been produced so far to be able to gather that information in single places to understand uh, climate change at local scales across the United States by combining the information across different organizations led by NOAA to be able to pull it together. Next slide. Um, so with all that data, with the census information that we're bringing in, understanding at local um, regions, we can un begin to understand exposure and vulnerability of populations. One minute. Um, from this, it's been really critical for us to work with uh, census and others to be able to understand vulnerabilities. Next slide. So no data, where are we going? Traditionally, for looking at the future of climate, we've had the IPCC. It produces scenarios of the future globally. However, that may not be sufficient going forward to be able to quantify macroeconomic risks. I've had experience working at two different banks and trying to be able to calculate macroeconomic risks and different risks due to climate. We may need new types of scenarios, new types of data, new types of information forecasted to be able to understand long-term risk. We may also need seasonal predictions. Picture is on the right. We've been doing seasonal predictions for the last few years. We know that hedge funds are starting to use them. They're showing up in commodities markets, trying to understand agriculture for early warning systems of agriculture, but also heat and air conditioning use. Um, so it also affects energy markets. So we may need new sets of information at different time scales to be able to forecast risk and then also understand it on a longer term basis. Also, I'd want to note that we need to really integrate the science with the economic economists here um, because the, when I've looked at a lot of the macroeconomic modeling, there's this expectations of very smooth glide paths. Um, there's also an expectation that if you overshoot um, a certain temperature and come back, 
everything can return to normal. But actually in the physical climate system, there are things that are lost that we don't get back. Glaciers and ice sheets, sea level rise, biodiversity and fisheries. And there's new emerging science around climate surprises. One recent one that came out is on ocean circulation. Ocean circulation may fundamentally change due to the climate change that we've imposed upon it. Um, this one thing is related to the Atlantic that may lead to to Europe being fundamentally drier and hotter in the future than it has been in the past, even if we overshoot and come back. So last slide. Um, so with this, I appeal to all of you in this group of um, please help us identify the opportunities of the new types of science and data that are required to be able to underpin this type of work. And we're really excited to be here to be able to support that from this group. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. The final panelist this morning will be Zach Lisko. Zach is the chief economist at the Office of Management and Budget and a professor at, the, at Yale Law School. Zach. Uh, great, so thanks so much uh, to, for uh, having me speak today and for all of you all convening to work on this extremely important uh, question. Uh, so what I wanna do today is give a little intro to the federal budget to help explain I think one important way that the work of this uh, panel could, could impact the real world. Next slide. So uh, this is the president's budget. Uh, we release that each uh, winter or, or spring, or at some point it will be released. Um, <laughs> uh, each, year, each year it's put out. Um, uh, it includes an economic forecast uh, used to project uh, the budgetary impacts of proposed spending uh, for each agency of government revenues and, and of new policies. And unlike the Congressional Budget Office, we very much are prescriptive. In fact, we prescribe like an entire vision. Uh, thank you. Uh, we prescribe an entire vision for what the government should look like uh, over the coming uh, year and over the coming decade. Uh, this budget then gives guidance to agencies and helps uh, set the agenda for, for Congress. Uh, the climate impacts uh, on the macro economy could matter in a variety of ways. Uh, one is that it's going to impact analysis of proposed policies, which are based on the economic assumptions. And climate, of course, can Im impact your economic assumptions. And then, of course, we care a lot about the trajectory of GDP. And, of course, climate harms are going to lower uh, GDP. Next slide. So each year, uh, we have a table uh, of economic assumptions. It includes things like inflation, like interest rates, but you know, right there up at the top uh, is GDP. And this is yeah, one of the foundation, maybe the foundational assumption that goes uh, into the budget. And you know, here are the assumptions that we uh, had had last year. And essentially what we're asking uh, for help with here is, is your help in helping us produce a better path uh, or a better guess of what GDP will look like over the next decade and beyond given uh, climate uh, transition risk and, and physical risk. Next slide. So one thing that we produce that ends up being kind of salient in our eyes uh, with, uh, one thing we produce with this data, uh, GDP and as well as uh, revenues and expenditures is what we think the long-term budget outlook is going to look like. So what this basically uh, amounts to is on the y-axis here, we have debt as a percentage of GDP. And on the y-axis, or sorry, on the x-axis, we uh, project that out uh, over time. So as you can see, there, you know, there's a big jump up there in, in 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, you know, we had high expenditures, uh, somewhat lower revenues. And what the budget does each year uh, is it, as it, you see there with the dotted lines, it says, Here's what debt to GDP is going to look like if we continue existing policies. And then with the lower line here, here's what debt to GDP will look like with the president's policies. So it is lower here because the president has a variety of tax proposals to raise revenue on those earning about $400,000 and you know, in, in big corporations. So I want you to focus on that, that dark black line here, which is you know, important for our internal planning and then also in, in, in public discourse. Next slide. So what we've done at this point in terms of incorporating climate uh, is add one scenario that incorporates climate impacts. So that's the, the new dotted line here, which is well above the, the black solid line. What this is, is a climate risk alternative in the long-term budget outlook. 
that incorporates one single emission scenario, which is a 95th percent worst outcome scenario for, from one particular paper. At a high level, it finds you know pr pretty striking things. It finds climate ri physical climate risks are very significant. We find that it increases uh, mid-century debt to GDP levels by, nine, uh, by 18 percentage points, uh, which is a lot. Uh, and then it decreases late century revenues by 7 percent of GDP or $2 trillion a year, uh, which is also, you know, also a lot. But at this point, you know, all we've done uh, is this one particular scenario. And again, what we, wa we want your help with here is you know, help, help us do better. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here's how these things matter uh, for you know for you know budget and our planning. We of course want higher GDP and lower debt to GDP. Incorporating climate impacts into the forecast is going to just overall help us make more appropriate uh, economic planning. And, and I assure you, as we engage in these discussions uh, across the White House and across the federal government, uh, we are very very much focusing on on revenue impacts, on GDP impacts. So this, this, this quantification matters quite a lot. And in particular, that's gonna help us make accurate trade-offs when considering economic policy. So of course, you know, the IRA, the climate provisions cost uh, quite a lot of money, but uh, they're also going to reduce climate harms and thus increase GDP uh, and tax revenue and also reduce spending uh, alongside uh, the off-budget benefits, which are of course very important, but allowing, but incorporating climate into the budget will allow us to have more accurate representations of the true budget impacts of things like, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act and things like that. So in short, uh, this uh, work here, climate macro, can be useful in shaping proposed policy as we consider what policies propose uh, and in determining the economic and budgetary impacts uh, of those policies. Next slide. So here's what we've done so far. Uh, we've convened an interagency technical working group, which, which Heather referred to, to develop a framework for incorporating climate risks into macroeconomic forecasting. This includes folks from throughout the federal government, and they've done uh, four things at this point. First, uh, they've informed an initial risk analysis in the long-term budget outlook. So that's the figure that I showed you before, the dotted line uh, that shows you know, much, much higher debt to GDP ratio going forward. Second, we've written, we have written a white paper uh, about a year ago, highlighting the resources that the US government has. Third, we've produced an initial assessment of resources required for this effort. Uh, and fourth, we've begun to evaluate candidate resources uh, for this effort. So I've already showed you number one, and let me go through uh, two through four now. Next slide. So uh, here's our white paper, uh, OMB, and the Council of Economic Advisors worked on this together and, and put it out uh, in April of last year. We had three high-level conclusions. Uh, first, the physical and transition effects are, are, are highly macro-significant. Uh, second, uh, to, to our sense, at, at least a year ago, and this is, you know, of course, rapidly evolving, uh, in terms of the current literature, there's actually fairly limited to our mind, to our minds, uh, fairly limited uh, policy relevance. Uh, and third, uh, the U.S. government has strong, perhaps unparalleled capabilities in energy, land system, and economic modeling, uh, you know, which is, of course, an important point of optimism. Next slide. And steps three and four are, are working toward a framework. So this working group, uh, which is which convened and continued through uh, the spring of last year and developed an outline of required resources to develop a U.S. government uh, climate macro forecasting capability. Part of this outline was a direct set of requests for funding and man hours, which we've been working on attaining. It also mapped out a rough timeline for meeting certain targets. This outline has been refined uh, throughout the fall and it's continuing now as certain resources were evaluated for use within uh, the current uh, economic assumptions framework, which I explained at the outset. We recognize that this is a, a multi-year uh, iterative framework as we continue to improve. Uh, we, our hope and belief is that there's gonna be incremental progress that's made each year until a complete framework can be integrated into the president's, uh, president's budget economic assumptions. And of course, we can continue improving after that as well. And as progress is made, uh, we can have a more complete risk analysis presented in the long-term budget outlook each year 
Uh, and that's what I showed you in those figures at the outset. Next slide. Uh, and I want to close here, uh, uh, kind of reiterating some oh, things man. that that and reflect and adding to some things that Heather said, in terms of some key data and analytic needs uh, that we think would be really helpful as we develop a climate macro framework to incorporate directly into the president's budget. Uh, the first is to develop uh, the ability to analyze a large range of scenarios and policy tools. Like Heather said, there's a lot of focus on carbon taxes. You know, the president has not proposed a carbon tax. He's proposed other policies. Uh, it'd be helpful to, to have uh, kind of help in, in, in analyzing those, uh, including things like regulations. Uh, second, uh, it's helpful to know more about realistic technology pathways. It's just a really complicated area. There are you know, lear various learning curves, performance improvements. Uh, it would be helpful to have a you know, comprehensive set of lower carbon alternatives. Uh, this is a complicated modeling. Uh, third, uh, there are lots of challenges associated with modeling a dynamic system, as other speakers have mentioned. There are issues of induced innovation, changing preferences, climate tipping points. You know, uh, for example, the uh, issues with the Atlantic Ocean and in Europe that were just discussed. Nonlinear damage functions. These are all very hard, and we would love for your help in incorporating them, uh, in their, their impacts in the macro forecast better. Uh, fourth, uh, there are hard macro questions for integrating into the macro uh, into the budget framework. In particular, uh, as you saw, you know we tend to focus on one central tendency. Like we have one line there. That's to some extent an average, but we're not typically thinking about things with very very long uh, right tails. Uh, and you know, it'd be helpful to uh, great to have your help and uh, thinking through that. And third. Uh, and sorry, and fifth, uh, there are questions of how physical and transition risks interact with each other and other macro outcomes it can be very complicated and we'd love your help on it. So uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you for working on these really important questions. Uh, we're really grateful as we move toward uh, developing better climate, or better economic forecasts to help develop better policies uh, for the president's budget. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. And thank you to all the panelists for excellent presentations. So at this point, we'll be moving on to a larger group Q&A. Uh, quick reminder um, that for roundtable members, both in the room and virtually, if you could raise your hand within Zoom, I'll be monitoring raised hands. And then for those public participants, if you could please submit your questions to via Zoom Q&A. So at that point, I see the hands lining up. Excellent. So. Paulina, you have a question. Um, thanks. And I guess this is a question to everyone, but maybe especially um, the economists in the Congressional Budget Office and the White House um, or the Office of Management and Budget. So everything was very focused on like or domestic impacts, right? Like, and so last year we saw big challenges with heat, extreme heat waves in India and Pakistan, rainfall, right? And so how do, how to, how can these models account for like macroeconomic impacts outside of the US, which I'm not an economist, but will absolutely affect the US economy, right? Yeah, I, I'm happy to start. So, um, so uh, global impacts are you know, super important. Uh, let me, I wanna emphasize, you know, when considering the US federal budget, that is just one, you know, in the scope of the whole world, one small piece uh, of climate impacts. You know, we are concerned with federal revenue, US federal revenues, US federal government spending. So that's our focus, but of course there are many other important questions. But even within that, there are lots of ways in which global impacts matter. For example, if if the European economy was heavily damaged uh, through you know way higher heat and very different temperatures, that would have very very large impacts on the on the U.S. economy and thus the U.S. Uh, budget because they're very large trading partners. So so uh, so that that's one way. But again, I just, I, just, I don't want to diminish uh, global impacts just because. Just because what the U.S. federal government's office managed budget is focused on is is ultimately the U.S. economy. 
Yeah, please, Heather. Yeah, this is such a great question. And I think, I think, I, I can't remember if it was Adele or Sarah, that, I think it was Adele actually that talked about, um, you know, there are all of these different ways that we need to think about our economic assumptions. So productivity, trade, I mean, all of these patterns are being affected by the physical and the transition risk. So to some extent, I mean, Zach's point, we are looking at what this means for, um, we in, in our role are looking at what this means for the U.S. economy and for um, U.S. budget outcomes. But as we're thinking about the modeling, you have to take these things into account. I mean, you know, just as a, a, a live news issue that's happening right now, of course, is because we did, we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, this is affecting how our trade partners are viewing us. Well, that has, I mean, all of these things, especially when you start adding them up, do have, they, they have consequences. So the, the fact that we've chosen a path of not doing carbon taxes, but doing subsidies is, um, is, 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 implicit in that is a, a trade policy agenda as well, which I think gets to just that, that there are tons of interconnections that we need to think about. Let me chime in on that. It's a really good question. Um, and I think like my colleagues on the panel, um, CBO's role is to try to understand the effect of climate change and climate change policy on, on the U.S. budget and the U.S. economy. Um, and, and so that tends to be the majority of, of our focus. Um, obviously, effects of floodings and climate damage are expected to be worse in other parts of the world than in the United States. And um, the, the fact that our job is to focus on a, a piece of that is not to ignore the rest of it. Um, I think there's other elements of um, risks to the rest of the government that aren't well understood that we need to uh, uh, that that we need to think about, and others and researchers need to think about. So one could imagine situations where there would be significant inter international migration, um, and that's just something that we have not uh, yet captured into you know, we. Uh, in, into our modeling or, or, or directly into our thinking. Um, similarly, if uh, if climate change impacts in other parts of the world lead to um, economic instability in those parts of the world, those will have significant implications for the United States. And um, that isn't that isn't yet part of our, our thinking, but it, it it clearly is there. Excellent. Uh, real quick. So we'll have about 35 minutes left of Q&A, and I am going to favor roundtable members initially. So I appreciate all the questions from the public. We will get to you, uh, but just be patient. So next question will be to Lars Hansen. Yeah, um, I want to thank the panelists for the very in very informative discussions and presentations of your challenges. Um, a couple of questions come to mind that that uh, were not explicitly addressed that I want to kind of bring up. And one is, if we want to think about the uncertainties faced by the private sector, by financial markets and, and, and the like, one big source is policy uncertainty. And so uh, that creates challenges for the private sector. And, and, um, and, and it, you know, anyone in the business of trying to quantify uncertainty for uh, has to address that. Um, and, and I think that's very important. And, and it shows up both in the short run, but also in the long run. There's lots of there was discussions here about the inter, inter interconnections between like physical risk and transition risk and the like. Well, um, policy responses is a part of the transition risk, I suppose. And then it, it, that if we find ourselves um, if we, if if, um, if we have uncertainty about the economic damage piece of it, and we find ourselves in the future. Having very severe damages, we um, we expect there to be different policy responses than if those you know, damages are somewhat less severe. So, so if you want to do long term on, on certain quantification, those type of dependencies have to show up as well. So, so it seems to me at least external people, external researchers, and the private sector have to confront this policy uncertainty it, it issue, and and there and and be very curious about your views about that. Um, I'm very much supportive of this notion of trying to. You know, bring in um, 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 uncertainty into policy, and I think that's very, very important. Many, you know, many of you talked about it. One one question that comes to mind there is, do we really need to give you exact probabilities? Because then, you know, once you start talking about um, so-called Knightian uncertainty, or we talk about deep uncertainties, the best we're going to be able to do is do things like probability bounds. And 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 is that something that policymakers are willing to deal with? Uh, probability bounds, because otherwise we're, we're going to have to make it. We'll just be making up stuff, and 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 I don't think that's very useful. Now, 
let me push that one step further. Um, and, the, and this showed up in some of Adele's comments, I think, uh, implicitly, but but uh, let me try to make it much more explicit. Once we start putting these uncertainties on the table, a, a, a very important question for policymaking is how averse should society be to these uncertainties? So we as scientists can't announce what societal aversion should be, but that aversion is going to matter, and it's going to matter in the design of what prudent policies are. Um, and you know, you know, you know, this is a trade-off between what are possible bad outcomes versus what we expect might be you know, most likely. Those type of trade-offs become very important in designing prudent policy. And so then how do we want to think about that? The most that uh, people, that external researchers can do is give you trade-offs between different type of aversions and what the consequences are. But 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 as a society, we have to face that. And so maybe we need to bring that into our language of uh, in, in terms of policy making and, uh, and uncertainty. Thank you. On that or? Um, I, all of those are just such important questions. Mm -hmm. I think this question of probability bounds, I mean, uh, if you are, so, so the fun, one of the fundamental challenges of government is that, um, you know, as, as Zach, uh, you know, talked about, we have to do a budget. We have to make decisions about how we're going to spend money, how we're going to develop resources. And for that, you can't, um, you know, how do you think about all of this uncertainty um, as you're trying to also act in the real world? And how do you represent that to, pol to other policymakers to build support for a particular agenda? Seems really challenging. Um, uh, we have, th you know, if you were to uh, put um, uh, yet at the same time, and I think that actually Joseph already mentioned this, we're already seeing that policymakers are dealing with that in the real world, mm -hmm. that the costs of damages are increasing, um, and they have to plan for a greater uncertainty or a higher level than they have had in the past. And so on the one hand, policymakers are implicitly, um, we've actually spoken a lot to state level policymakers, especially in California, who've been really like, wow, we're spending so much money. They know that, but they aren't writing it down in the same way that they, they that they might have thought about those issues in the past. So I think that opens a little bit of a door. But the other thing um, in terms of policy is that while we have um, global commitments and the president is given this clear goal that we want to get to net zero by 2050, there isn't a political consensus around that or a mandate in, say, the same way that there is around the Fed. Right. The Fed has this dual mandate of um, uh, uh, employment and price stability where we can then plan because we know that if those things get out of line, the Fed's going to act. But we don't have that on in, in this set of issues yet. And it feels like that that is one of the things that how do we how so we've set out this goal, but do we believe it? Um, and but we believe it with the Fed, but we don't believe it when it comes to the fiscal. So there's there's some there's some thinking there and work to be done. Um, that might help us deal with some of that, which it will help us deal with that uncertainty that we're going to reach this goal, but but not how we're going to reach it, which I think is the other um, uh, big question. But I'll pause and let my colleagues. So so I, I want to thank you for that question, Lars. Um, I think you're exactly right that policy uncertainty is an important part of this discussion. And, you know, especially in the United States where we don't have that, legal authority established in law that sets that long-term trajectory to incentivize a lower carbon and greenhouse gas transition. Other countries have more in their law. And so they th their projections are, are less uncertain, at least with respect to existing law. I don't know what probability distribution to put around what Congress is going to do you know, two years from now, five years from now, or whenever. And so when we talk about transition risk in the United States, what what a lot of what we're talking about is policy uncertainty. It's not the case that we know what that probability distribution is. And so when we do the macroeconomic projections, often the way we address that uncertainty is through positing a resolution to the policy uncertainty. Okay, we're going to simulate a carbon tax or a cap and trade bill or something like that, and we run the model, and then we do sensitivity analyses to say, okay, what if we're wrong about the cost of nuclear technology or the availability of carbon capture and storage or something like that, that we know 
is important to the economic outcomes. So we do those sensitivity analyses, but there might be better ways to capture this kind of uncertainty that are more structural and kind of less ad hoc. So that's something to think about. And then, and then I would say the, the uncertainties and risks on the physical side are of a whole different nature. And those we're gonna need the input from scientists to you know, think through what are the right ways to represent those kinds of uncertainties. And you're absolutely right in the endogeneity of policy to the physical damage outcomes. I, I think that is true. How averse we should be is not a new question to environmental policy, right? There's a whole literature on the precautionary principle and how we should undertake um, you know, measures that might have costs but reduce risks and, and so on. So I think there's work that could be brought to bear that brings some of that environmental economics literature to this macroeconomic question around climate and, and see if there are things we already in the literature we could build on and what else we need to develop for, for this particular context. Thank you. I'll, I'll just add, add quickly, I think it's a great point. Um, I think that it, we would benefit from more research, especially research that's accessible to policymakers, especially research that makes kind of a quantitative case that policy that is more certain, maybe longer term, but in any case more certain, it should be like a first order thing that we should pay attention to. Um, but I think it's a great point. And I think uh, my hunch is there's a lot more to be done that we, that we would benefit from. Thank you. Okay, Sarah, and then, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, quickly, I would also say from the literature and from my experience looking in the private sector, there's been a lot more on the transition risk quantification of the macroeconomic part. And uh, there will also be policy uncertainty around adaptation and the physical risks, particularly as we look at uh, the manifestations around water security and drought and what's happening with drought, that the policy decisions around water and water use and those things as drought unfolds um, into the future with increasing changes in risk may also lead to uncertainty. But at least on the physical side, we have directional certainty and understanding of where we're going and much better uh, capability of forecasting that on a short-term basis and a long-term basis. And so it um, provides us with directional information as the translation of what's expected into actual behavioral change, which is the difficult part, given that so much cost analysis is based on historical experience rather than trying to model it out into the future. Okay, let's move on. Real, real quick, charge everyone is that we have a good queue of, of people wanting questions. Let's be concise, both in formulating our questions and our responses so we can try to get to everyone in the queue. I'd appreciate that. So the next question will be Bob Kopp. Hi, uh, thanks, Brad, and thanks, everyone. Um, I want to pick up on the risk uh, question from a slightly different angle. Um, so Adele um, talked about how when you're thinking about supervision or financial stability, um, you know, there, there's this interest in sort of what IPCC would call low likelihood, high impact um, storylines or outcomes. Uh, so, so questions of how, you know, are, is, are the institutions and is the system uh, resilient uh, to shocks? I'd be curious to hear from some of the other people on the panel, particularly the folks working on budget, um, how they think about these sorts of tail risks um, and the, the, the thing I want to point to as an example, if you think about, for instance, the National Flood Insurance Program, right, if you, if you look at, um, you know, if you have sufficiently fat tail distributions, expectations can become ill-defined. And so you end up, uh, you know, having a very different expectation for, um, uh, from the hundred billion dollar or billion dollar damages, what your annual trough hurricane damages are, uh, if you're looking at 1980 to 2004 versus 1980 to 2005, um, and I would like to hear from the people focused on the budget how, how you think about dealing with with some of these issues. So great, great question, Bob. Um, let me let me offer a couple of thoughts um, from from uh, from my perspective. Um, one is that I agree that that I, um, that understanding risk and uncertainty and conveying that to policymakers is incredibly important. 
And I would, um, we, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, we had this, uh, I made reference to a slide that I didn't show about how um, the expectation of climate damage um, from hurricanes was fairly narrow in 2025 and long right tail by, by 2075. Um, one thing that's important to understand and um, can, can be frustrating in its own right is that from the perspective of um, cost estimation for the Congress, we need a single baseline against which to um, estimate the effect of policies. Um, and, and that has the effect, um, so, so flood insurance was, was uh, mentioned. CBO prepares a baseline estimate of the cost of flood insurance under current law. Uh, for 10 years, and that's something we publish. Um, we, uh, we recognize that there's significant uncertainty around that, um, and it's a reflection of current law. It's not actually a reflection of sort of our projection of what we think is going to necessarily happen. Um, but part of the budget scoring process is um, to have a basically a concrete measuring stick against which we can measure the costs of proposals. And that's different, I think, than saying, you know, here's a here's a uh, um, a projection of the cost of flood damage and some uh, some cone of uncertainty about that that would go out um, and I you know well honestly well beyond ten years and I think that's things that we can take on in some of our analytical work um, but actually not in in our baseline work um, so let me stop there and see if uh, if Zach or somebody else wants to respond as well. Yep. I think it's a great question. Uh, I, I, for the most part, I throw that back at the group in, in helping us learn how to do that better with respect to climate. Uh, but I, I think for the most part, I, I don't have much to add. I think we have a baseline. So that, that first dotted, I showed you that first uh, figure with the, the dark line, which was the president's budget and the dotted line above it, which was the baseline. So that's the baseline for their federal budget. We, so we're, we're stuck with, I think we're basically stuck analytically with having the one baseline uh, but we should incorporate uncertainty better uh, into that. I, would, I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move on. Uh, James Stock. Hi, yes. Uh, again, that was a terrific presentation. So I just learned a lot and it was really helpful and succinct. Um, I, I have, a, I guess, two questions. So one of them has to do with, uh, I guess, maybe the contrast between the exercise that, uh, that Zach presented that OMB did about making this bad case uh, outcome modification, uh, and then the and then a particular slide that Joe showed for the CBO, and I think that the question has to do with one of the arrows in Joe's slide. So the way, if I understand it correctly, uh, what OMB did in this implementation is you took a particular paper. They had some they had some equations about the effect of climate on GDP. You change the GDP path. The lower GDP path is going to generate less revenues. You're still going to have some spending plans, and so you have a worst case budget, fiscal situation. The point is, there's no closing of the loop there. That's just taking this exotic, this this uh, path from the literature. CBO, uh, Joe, you had an arrow going from spending or the macro economy back to uh, climate. And that means that sort of you're conceptualizing maybe where you want to be is with an I am. I think that's a that's a big question. It's uh, I, I'm just going to leave it. I have an opinion, but I, I, but I'm actually just curious about that. It opens a whole world of questions. Second is there's a fair amount of discussion here. So second question, maybe this is a Joe Zach question. Also, there's a fair amount of discussion about um, sort of what I would think of as micro policy impacts. So. Uh, in the CBO paper uh, that looks at the, where you estimate about 600 million metric tons reduction from the IRA, uh, that's going to have certain budgetary impact, impacts and so forth. Those budgetary impacts are going to spill through the model uh, because of the uptake. And so you're building that in as endogenous. To what extent or where do you think about in this exercise that we're talking about today, where do you think about drawing, how do you think about drawing the lines in terms of like these micro policy impacts and building those into the, the various CDO models? And, and the you know, of course, the power sector one is big, but then you can go down uh, into some of the much smaller ones in the in, in the IRA. And, and those and CBO has responsibility for analyzing those, but maybe the macro, where do we think about that in terms of the macro modeling part of it? 
Two really good questions, Jim. Um, let me see if I can take a, a quick stab at each one. Um, in our analysis of of the uh, the macro effects of um, uh, of climate change, we basically developed this estimate of one percent by by twenty fifty, and we now incorporate that into um, in, into our baseline estimate. I think we'd like to um, we'd like to update that. And I think that's something where we could really benefit from um, the people that are participating in this in this program and the research community more generally into trying to understand basically the structural ways that climate change is going to affect um, productivity, labor supply, capital formation, the things that go into um, into a to a growth model. And um, in doing our work, and I think this um, I'll let Zach talk about what OMB does, but we very much tried to hit the middle of a distribution. Um, and so in that we were um, we were picking sort of moderate climate scenarios and um, uh, I, maybe I'll just I'll stop there uh, just in the in interest of time. Um, but we very much are trying to understand how that affects GDP and then that has effects on uh, um, on revenue collections and so forth. Um, and that's that's I guess where I'll stop on that part of the question. I hope it's, hope it's responsive, Jim. Um, on on the second question, we haven't yet connected as well as we would like um, the different. So our analysis of the effects of the subsidies in the Reconciliation Act were essentially of what they would do to um, to CO two emissions. And we get questions from the Congress about, well, how is that going to feed back in terms of um, damage avoided and therefore reduced spending in the future uh, and, and, and those kinds of channels? And we aren't yet to a point where we can, uh, we can connect those links as well as we would like to. Um, I, I think it's something we're working on. It's something that um, anybody else contributes to. We'll be glad to pick it up. If I could just um, make a comment on that, I mean, I think that brings up a really interesting question, which is that um, we have not thought of emissions as a core economic assumption, um, and it just—I mean, the way that the that the, that it plays both into the physical damages, the transition that it feeds back into the model year after year, it does seem like that's a question that I have for the group. Is as we're thinking about the core the core aggregates that we're watching. Um, this is what's shifting, and if uh, and it's kind of elevating this into our econ conversation in a new and different way. And I think Joe just actually summarized why that feels like a really important question um, for how you're thinking about uh, the uncertainties in the in the planning. Uh, I'll just, just add quickly. Uh, great questions uh, on the first. Just descriptively, you're, you are right that it is not a closed loop. Uh, when we did our scenario. Uh, we would uh, love for, for help in, in, in closing the loop and, and, and doing the macro forecast. Uh, second, uh, on the kind of micro policy impacts, uh, I wanted to point to a different part of the president's executive order. So part of what we've emphasized here, the GDP impacts, but when it comes to the budget, you know, the, there's the, the economic assumptions, but there's also estimates of spending across the whole federal government. We are currently engaged in a government-wide effort to have better estimates of spending that incorporates uh, climate impacts. You know, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, uh, FEMA, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I, I'm not. It's unclear to me how much that relates to the work of this group. But if it does, uh, that's that is work that we would love to have uh, more guidance on, as we complement the top-down GDP from the with the uh, bottom-up category by category spending. Um, which is that this work that, that Zach and I are talking about is just section 6A of an executive order that has, you know, one through five and, and others. I mean, he just talked about 6B um, and C, but all of those other pieces, different parts of government are looking into. Excellent. Thank you. That's one. The, the powers that be have said that we can run over a bit because uh, we still have quite a queue. I have 11 10 or 11 questions remaining. So if everyone could kind of cooperate and try to move through as many as we can, we'll try to finish up by a quarter after. So Laurie Hunter. 
And my question is actually quite easy. It's um, not substantive, it's organizational. I was excited to hear about the interagency technical working group, Zach and, Zach and OMB. I just felt like some of the mandates of that group were quite parallel to ours. And so I just wanted to ask if there were some overlaps, synergies, um, joint work, somebody on this group from that group or vice versa. Um, that's my question. Do you want to take that anyone? Yes. <laughs> Many of us are in the room. <laughs> Fantastic. I didn't know that because I wasn't sure who was on the interagency working group. That's really great to hear. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thank you. Solomon, you're up. <laughs> uh, hi. I just have two quick questions inspired by things that were actually said uh, recently. The one was, um, just about the budget baseline. So if the budget baseline is our projection under current policy, um, has it has, has anyone been talking about the notion that climate should, the impacts of climate change should be baked into that baseline? And instead of saying the baseline is one baseline and then when we account for climate, it goes down. It seems like under current policy, we ought to have the lower baseline that accounts for climate. And if we take action, it will go up. Um, so that's one question. The other question was that Joe said something about uh, instability around the world having important economic impacts. I totally agree. And I, I think there's a sense in the literature that that's one of the really big challenges that we want to think about. I just wanted to ask if there was any precedent for incorporating projections of some type of instability um, in the past, like with something that's not climate, maybe just something to help us think about how we could do that in a useful way. So um, good, good questions on the, on the first question or first observation. Um, short answer is yes. If we have a um, sort of improvement in the climate future, that ought to be reflected in um, you know like a, a projection of GDP. And we would welcome um, the the feedback of this group in how to how to develop those feedbacks. Um, I don't actually have a a good example off the top of my head in response to your second question. Uh, though it's a really good one. Defense. On incorporating into the baseline, uh, you, you you said better than I did what, what the aspiration is. So you you, you uh, described it exactly right. That, that's what we want to do. I would just say that the Federal Reserve has a program called Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review, also known as our stress testing program. And in some instances, uh, and I am not an expert on this, our scenarios do include variables that apply to other countries. And uh, that might be one example where we are looking at outcomes in other countries and assessing how that pertains to uh, issues in our own jurisdiction. Good. Thank you. Uh, Bilal, you're next. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> thank you for the insightful uh, presentation. My question is about the fact that we are dealing with a system of systems, um, and certainly the, the risks that we are addressing here, they fall in some form of a hierarchy. There is a lot of complexity. And if I, if I try to maybe come up with a hierarchy, I'll say there is the primary ones, which is direct climate risk, uh, as were presented by Sarah and others, uh, the, the drought, the temperature, and the storms, and so on. Uh, and then there is a secondary layer of risks that is consequential in nature, and this will be uh, possibly uh, water, uh, water supply impacts, food shortages, and so on. And then you could define maybe uh, another le level, treasury, which could be migration and so on. And then possibly war could be another layer that could be added. Uh, so in defining a policy and doing projections and realizing the fact that was stated repeatedly, you'd like to stay in the, in the middle of the curve, right? Would you consider in projections and policies all of those uh, high, uh, outer layers? Um, I mean, I could see it. It's, a, it's a somewhat manageable to stay within the primary risk. But the minute we venture into the other levels, uh, the, the state of the system becomes 
it's not the same anymore. It's not the same system that I'm dealing with. It's almost we are transitioning to other systems, other states, um, uh, and even planning for it. Uh, it, it could be, uh, I'm not sure to what extent it can be realistic to plan for a war that could happen at the second, at a third order of a scenario construction. Um, I, I think I'm maybe I'm trying to understand the scope of how OMB and the economic advisors think in terms of uh, helping us to come up with projects and future pursuits that will help you in, in providing you know input in, in this in this area. Thank you. I can make one comment on that. I, I, um... I think, you know, and I, I started my my remarks on this, that the president has focused on achieving our climate goals while also making sure that this, um, you know, as, as he likes to say, when he thinks of climate, um, he thinks of jobs. And that is a political economy framework that he has brought to this, which is that if we don't make sure that this is good for communities, it's um, if we don't help communities get through this transition where, you know, the Ford plant that produced the the fossil fuel based trucks is now closing, but the ones that are making the EVs are opening how that's chaotic for for communities. That that is why this macroeconomic work is actually so important because um, there's a lot of climate stuff happening. That's all chaotic, but there's also a lot of labor and industry stuff that is happening that is chaotic for local, state, federal budgeting and communities. So I think if I understand your, your question correctly, that is, that's one of the purposes of doing this is to figure out how you can create that economic stability so that you can actually deal with the deeper problem of climate. Because if you can't do one, you won't be able, the theory of the case is you won't be able to do the other. Sarah. Yeah, I'll add that on early part of the reason there's also money being spent on early warning systems is that we know those extremes are getting worse and more likely. But also, if we have time in advance and we plan in advance for how to deal with them, um, those can be mitigated. So that's why us, USDA, USAID, state are all working on these warning systems of temperature and precip that then feed into the food early warning systems and water availability ones. Um, and that's why that's so critical to create the plans around what to do when those extremes actually happen. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentations today. Um, a, a couple of quick questions, just going back to a challenge that Sarah raised, which is that the latest climate science is signaling really transformative, profound, multi-generational risks, including the potential for tipping points. Um, and we know what's happening already around us, but you know, when you look out in the future and the fact that many economic models uh, or economic decision making, I shouldn't say models, are, are still structured around a kind of incremental smooth thinking uh, where you can turn a dial down, up and down and, and make decisions. And there's a kind of a mismatch in the time horizons uh, around which decisions are being made uh, when we think about uh, many of the conventional decision making uh, formats in which uh, current financial markets are structured. So what do we do to incorporate these kind of bring this future to the present? And there are lots of ideas that have bubbled up here. There, there are adjacent things like the social cost of greenhouse gases that it, the EPA just recently updated. Um, but how do we bring this to bear so that we're not making locking ourselves into futures now by kind of keeping our heads down and looking at the next you know, 10, 20 years, when in fact, these are multi-generational impacts you know, to the point that um, uh, Adele made, the precautionary principle is really helpful. And in this context, we're talking about multi-generational and global kinds of impacts and precautions that we need to keep in mind. Um, the second piece is the distributional aspects. So a focus on GDP and this kind of macro view really loses the way uh, climate change is fundamentally a very inequitable challenge, both in the United States and around the world. It's compounding and intersecting uh, with existing socioeconomic and racial disparities, but it's also exacerbating them and, and, and uh, creating more challenges over time. So what are the kinds of metrics we can bring into this conversation so we don't lose some of those uh, really fundamental justice and equity pieces that are reflected in the problem, but also need to be reflected in the solutions if they're gonna be fit for purpose? like to 
Well, maybe I'll just say real briefly, there is a lot of congressional interest, not just in um, sort of things like GDP, but in, in how climate change and climate change policy would be distributed. And I guess I can, um, we've said this publicly. So one project we have ongoing actually is to look at how um, flood risk is expected to affect um, different communities by income and income distribution and uh, various demographic uh, characteristics. And I, and I think that work in that kind of, in that space actually would help um, uh, lawmakers think it, that, that that's more across dis, um, distributional lines than your intergenerational point, um, which I think is an excellent point. I don't have anything to add particularly on that, but uh, um, work on the distributional aspects of this is, is quite welcome. I, I will add to that. I mean, certainly the president has, um, you know, his EJ40 commitments and is committed to um, questions around equity. But, you know, Rachel, I think you're actually getting to so much of why this work is so important. Um, you know, we we were able to do macroeconomic thinking for decades with a stable climate and all of the negative externalities, which any economist in the room would tell you were very important. They weren't measured and they weren't they hadn't bubbled up. So this is an opportunity to rethink some of that. Um, and so I would encourage you to keep asking those questions as we go through this, this, these conversations, but um, it, 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 you know, fundamentally we're having to, we're having to figure out ways to take that into account, but it, that's not the way our tools were built. So that is, I think the purpose here today. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Wendy. Um, all right, so I want to I want to just speak in favor of the baseline again. Um, so I think for for these macroeconomic models to be most useful for policymakers, policymakers want to know what the economy will look like on lots and lots of different dimensions if they sit on their hands, and that tells them then then separately. Uh, where's their value added if they don't sit on their hands? How much better can they make the world? So what that means is that we want macroeconomic models that can hold policy fixed. Um, now, whether or not that's only holding federal policy fixed, whether or not that's also holding state and local policy fixed, at least being really transparent about what's being held fixed uh, in all of your climate projections that are then fed into a macro model. Um, so it's a world, let's say, federal policy doesn't change. And I think that's the baseline that CBO is thinking about. Um, and so CBO did indeed incorporate into its projection, um, I think this is just to answer Saul's question uh, in a different way, Joe answered it, but it, using different words, that um, you know, one of the challenges of this is that climate has been changing over the last several decades. And so some of this is already in the trends. And if we actually thought that the next few decades were going to, you know, the, the climate was going to continue to change as it has over the past few decades, then we might actually say it's all in the trends. Absolutely still possibly worth parsing out, but could be that we that we're pretty confident about our macroeconomic projections, and we do this on other in other contexts. So, like on the positive side, economists spend a lot of time thinking about how increasing education matters for projections. Um, we, you know, education's been increasing for a very long time in the U.S. globally, but that doesn't stop us from then trying to parse it out from our models about how education is going to matter going forward. And then moreover, we say, oh, but it looks like, in fact, the future of education and, you know, the growth in education and the effectiveness of education is actually going to be different from the past. So we can't just extrapolate trends. And so we have a lot of, we do this in lots of other contexts. And on the flip side, we do this on the military side as well. We think very much about is the world getting less safe? Um, it does, um, uh, uh, you know, are we are we having to spend extra money to keep ourselves safe from, you know, uh, risks in the U.S. and in a way that's hurting productivity growth, et cetera? So we do it on the. That's just to make a plug for the fact that it is done on the, on the, on the on the global side. But what this means is that the deltas around how different climate outcomes affect the economy are really hard to think about 
in the context of these models that I these model outcomes that I think are most useful for policymakers that are really about the baseline. I think we want to know what the economy, including the distribution of the economy, equity issues, all the good stuff under the hood, what it what it looks like if policy stays unchanged. But of course, that has to include how does the private sector adapt? So, you know, it ha it has to be if federal policymakers, let's say, sat on their hands, okay, let's make our lives easier, and state and local policymakers too. Well, the private sector is not going to sit on its hands. So if you're really going to create a model of a baseline for policymakers to look at, you have to think really hard then about how the private sector adapts. But what that means is, what does the composition of the economy look like? Um, you know, I just want to, like, this, this thing about creating a baseline and knowing what things look like if policymakers don't don't take additional action over and above what they've already taken is incredibly useful and incredibly important to decision making and incredibly hard. Um, I just wanted to react to one piece on the trend and expecting that we can use the trend. Um, we're expecting accelerations in certain parts of the climate, but also some of these new exposures that we've never even had before, like over 700 people dying in the extreme heat wave that happened last summer in the Pacific Northwest that we otherwise have no analog for in the entire record. Um, that's part of the true difficulty of trying to model this out more is that society was built and we've adapted to a, a climate that is no longer exists, but also fundamentally is disrupting and changing in ways that will really create shocks if we all model out my worst fears plus your worst fears and then put them all together. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, we can't expect the um, past to be able to be useful on that point. No, I think I think that's exactly right. And um, like in in the work we did, um, we incorporate sort of both the past trends and then we we make an explicit adjustment for changes in those trends going forward. Um, but I think Wendy's point is that um, we want to create models that capture those changes in the future in the baseline. And those are changes in the real world. Um, but then to Wendy's, the lawmakers sit on their hands point, we want to understand how um, a changing real world and a static policy um, create, can be used to create a baseline against which we can measure the effects of policy changes. Okay, very good. Uh, Bob. Yeah. Hey, uh, two two questions. Questions are quick. The answers may not be. Um, so one, I think I, you know, in response to Saul's question, somebody muttered uh, about defense. Um, I, I'm wondering if anybody wants to expand on, um, you know, how we how we think uh, in terms of the baseline, in terms of the potential for exogenous shocks like war breaking out, and the benefits of uh, national you know defense preparedness in the baseline. Um, the second, uh, sort of taking my role as a coacher, I saw several of the questions on um, the online relate to the question of the limitations of GDP. And so I wanted to uh, see if anybody wanted to take the opportunity to talk about the national natural capital accounting uh, strategy. Yeah, the importance of uh, national capital is really being able to quantify the value of our nature, ca nature capital in the country. Um, and part of that is you have regions where GDP is growing, where you have nature capital degradation, which um, quantifies the true impact that may not be seen for later. And so you need different accounting methods to be able to pull in all of them. Um, and so with that, there's dramatic push forward now on how do we assess that? How do we quantify it? And how do we start taking stock of that? So, sorry, I, I, just to jump in, could, could somebody be more, a little more specific about what the administration is is doing? I, you know, I, I glanced at the document that was released, but probably most people haven't, um, and it would be helpful. Yeah, the document came out last week, and it's um, it's to be able to create, how are we going to start creating these accounting methods, and how are we going to start moving forward on making those metrics and then doing putting them out? And so it's a multi-step process for being able to quantify uh, our biodiversity, our natural lands, the conservation efforts necessary, and then being able to track that over time. So we have an idea of how that is changing over time going forward, like we do with other traditional economic indicators. 
I guess I just add, add quickly, uh, I, along with the rest of OMB, is like extremely, extremely excited about natural capital accounting. Uh, it's you know the right way to right way to do it. Uh, it's important to recognize that we're probably a long way away from those statistics being uh, developed, uh, let alone being incorporated in, into the budget. Uh, so, although yeah, extremely, extremely valuable, it, it's it is very, very much worth the effort to focus on improving traditional methods of GDP because you know that's the way we do budgeting today, and and, uh, and for better or worse, probably will be doing for a decent period of time. Okay, uh, I think at this point, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and move on to some of the questions from the public. Uh, I see we have a couple raised hands, including my own, but uh, to give some opportunity to the public, what I'll do is, so uh, Dr. Kapnick, how are you estimating how society is responding to flood and other climate shocks? What are your parameters and scale? Um, we're still developing those out, but we have it on a cost basis. So the cost basis of the damages that are caused, uh, lives lost, inundation of water, um, and then others are being developed. Okay, super. And that was from Despondjana. Uh, Gerald Stokes, uh, much of the, there are a couple here on GDP, I'll, I'll try to combine them. Uh, much of the governmental perspective is GDP based. Uh, which is understandable. However, is this really sufficient? And Gerald suggests perhaps a five capitals approach or other approach to societal value would be more useful. Gina went on and says, you know, GDP counts uh, results from climate catastrophe, cleanups, et cetera. What efforts can be done to redefine GDP in so that it only measures positive steps in addressing climate change? So if people could address sort of those aspects of GDP alternatives or modifying GDP itself to better reflect impacts. So um, I won't speak to, to modifying GDP. I mean, that's what part of what the natural capital accounts are trying to do, and that is a, a challenge. But I think that you know, this conversation that we've just been having about the baseline and how we're thinking about what goes in there and how we account for climate damages that are rising feels like a really important piece of that conversation. So we're all here because we think that that is an important thing to incorporate into our macroeconomic work, but it that is the work to be done. It's starting to be done. Are we doing the, do we have the best methods of doing that? And I think one of the things that you hear up here um, from the policy perspective is that all of this is about um, people moving in um, herds or groups, right? So, so OMB is not going to do something totally wacky different from what CBO is doing, which is not going to be something totally wacky different from what the blue chip forecasters are doing, which is not going to be totally something very different from what the IFIs are doing and the Fed. And so I think a core part of this conversation is um, we need to be incorporating all this modeling that we have not been. We all need to bring it in, but figuring out together how to um, come up with that list of must do, must haves and nice to haves feels like the way to get that conversation about GDP into, or the, some of our critiques about what it does and doesn't measure into here. Because if we're taking into account uh, physical damages and the lost human life in ways that we weren't before, that gets us at least some of the way there, um, which is you know separate from the the, the remeasurement of GDP. But I just kind of want to emphasize for those who are listening that this is an opportunity to have that conversation in a slightly different venue um, and to rethink what that baseline is. But we have to; it, it has to be together. Yeah, and also based on how those things are quantified and what we want, we have to build the science and technology to actually deliver on that as well. I guess on the GDP thing, one thing that might help people think about this issue is you can think of GDP as a flow of economic activity, right? This is a this is consumption and other factors that go into that flow of economic activity. Separate from that, is the productive capital stock of the economy. So a hurricane comes in and destroys buildings and homes and infrastructure. That is a real loss to the physical capital stock of our country, not to mention outcomes uh, you know, on people's lives and livelihoods, right? So GDP is not the measure to capture 
the loss of the capital stock in the economy and the ability of the economy to produce more flows of economic activity, right? So you're gonna need different measures to capture the capital loss than, than a measure that is intrinsically associated with flows. I don't know if that helps, but. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on with a public question from Bai. Uh, how do we know that we are doing enough in terms of climate and natural ecosystems? And how are we doing or performing compared to other organizations and countries? Um, yeah, to be able to take stock and measure this, we are at the forefront of trying to do those conservation efforts and the measurement and being able to create the science and technology to do so. And uh, across organizations internationally, we work across many different ones, collaboratively with our partners on those efforts to build that science, build that technology, and be able to do that monitoring. Okay, uh, maybe I'll ask through my questions real quick. Sort of, it's a double double sides here. One is, I think I'll start with Adele. Uh, you mentioned and, and made a really compelling case for considering different scenarios from you know the high impact sort of scary event. Well, I won't say you didn't use scary, but you said stressful scenarios to more likely scenarios. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, my question to you is, is clarity of message because these conversations don't don't take place independently. So it's a very complicated landscape already. How would you approach it and how would you suggest you maintain clarity but address these different scenarios? Oh, thanks for the question. I think it's really important to be super clear about what you're doing with your analysis. What do you what are you trying to inform? If you're trying to inform what emissions mitigation policies should we adopt and how do we make them as cost effective as possible? And we wanna measure the benefits of those policies relative to the cost of those policies. Okay, that's a policy analysis framework. And then you need scenarios that are appropriate for the no policy scenario versus the policy scenario. And then you measure costs and benefits and distributional outcomes and emissions and you know all the things that go into a proper policy analysis. If you're doing something else, like supervision, you're trying to balance the costs and benefits of something very different, which is ensuring the safety and soundness of an individual financial institution against various shocks that could disrupt their solvency, right? So in that case, you want a scenario that properly captures the risks that you want um, uh, financial institutions to take into account in their management of, of risk, right, as a, as a regulator. So I think as long as you're really clear about what it is you're trying to accomplish with your scenarios, kind of the scenarios will follow, right? And they'll have different data characteristics and different time horizons and different, um, you know, uh, like I said, disaggregation and, and household income distribution or region or, or, uh, or sector or what have you. And you're gonna have to structure those scenarios in a way that allows you to serve the mandate that you're, you're, you're focusing on for that particular analysis. Okay, thank you. And, and then the other side of my question is for Joe and the CBO, where you emphasize that you use middle of distribution solutions. And I'm wondering if you could say just a few thoughts on how the CBO thinks about and incorporates that uncertainty. No, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, we do try to hit the middle of the distribution, and I think that's um, just a reflection of our nonpartisan stance. Um, and for certain things, like the economic baseline and like cost estimation, we're actually required to um, provide basically point estimates. And that's the that requirements in, in the law and the way that the budget rules are set up. In doing that, um, say in the cost estimating world, we try to discuss sources of uncertainty. And um, I'm somewhat less constrained in the, the work that I lead um, talking about um, 
basically some of the analytical reports that we write. And in those, we, we do our best to try to um, highlight sort of areas of uncertainty and quantify it where we can. Um, and I think that's where, um, you know, more research we can do, but also more research that can be done by this group will, will really be valuable in trying to understand how um, the distribution of, our, of, of outcomes um, can occur. And this actually goes back to Lars's point um, very early in the, in the Q&A. So great question. Thanks. Okay. I think at that point, we didn't get to everything, but we did very well. Thank you all uh, for working through those questions. And so at this point, I think first, thanks to the speakers. So we're going to really enjoy it. Great way to start off the day. At this point, we'll break for lunch and how much we'll have cut it short to 45 minutes. We'll reconvene uh, at, at 1 p.m. Eastern time, so the top of the hour. Okay, great. Thank you, Bridget. Thanks again, everyone.